be colored. Share screen. All right, optimize the video clip. Okay, yeah. And then get the music going. Some of these are more contemporary.
Yeah, this is obviously a modern one. <laughs> I like this one. What was that? <laughs> She's playing an electric guitar. It's, it's obviously a modern one. That was an oog. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, you're welcome. It was fun putting it together. Stunning. Yeah. Stunning. I'm glad yeah. I stayed. Yeah, Sorry. The scenes from uh, courtship and human love, romantic love. You see the war scenes, the animal, the hunting scenes, and then people just relaxing in the garden, enjoying the um, drink for tea. Who put that together? It was beautiful. Yeah, Fresh Day. Fresh Day did it. Um, for the last weeks. And yeah, thank you. Fresh Day. Good job. She thank really you. spent yeah. a lot of time. I don't know how much time he spent just collecting all those. But that was, yeah, that was it might nice. even be, I don't know if you were running it, um, you know, with within PowerPoint, when you say run slideshow, it will go completely full screen. So then we won't see any of that. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. That would be great. Yeah, Fereshti, could you by any chance post this online on the Circle of Friends, you know? Yeah, yeah I'll be happy to. I would I'll love, to, would see love to see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And That's just be awesome. able to pause with some of them. Some of them are just so exquisite. Yeah. It just well, they all are, but certain ones just really jumped out. There, I made sure lovely. the one you loved was there, Cheryl. I'm <laughs> you sorry. Had you had commented last time that when Joe was showing one of them that you really liked, so I made sure that was in there. I think oh. it was. <laughs> um, no, I didn't see it, but okay. there were some other ones. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that that was so wonderful. Thank you. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's a lot of work putting that together. I know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I well, love there must have been them. about what thirty or forty of them. Yeah, forty. Forty. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I forget. <laughs> right. And so, anyway. what was what was the instrument? Was it uh, a classical instrument or or what? Um, uh -huh. I sent Joe a couple of uh, YouTube videos. Uh, let's see. Which I'll go back to it. Play? Here you go. Wait a minute. Here, I get those. The person who, who was playing on this was Hossein Alizade. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Is he, yeah. Um, it reminds me of how much I love Persian music, classical Persian music. Oh my God. <laughs> it's incredible music. Well, what what was the instrument? Was it an oud or was it something else? A lyre? Or... It was tar. I think what? T-A-R. It's a T-A-R. Oh, what is a tar? I've the never heard of it. The oh, setar. The setar. Yeah. It has oh, a setar. Strings. Oh, okay. Setar, setar. Setar, but setar, which only has three strings. Setar. Mm -hmm. But it's S-E-T-A-R, um, Elizabeth. Yeah. Let's see if I can get it. S-E? Yes, it's supposed to. Yeah, it, but that's Persian, you see. So oh, S-I-T-A-R is Indian. Okay, thank you. That's great awesome. to know. If you've ever heard them play the tar, the setar in, in the garden at, Mar at Upper Maribad in the dining room garden, I'll go, oh my God. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, that's it. Um, so it's called 
classical music from Iran, great masters of the setar, S-E-T-A-R. If you wanna connect to that, okay? Thank you. Yeah, now let's see here. So uh, let's just segue into a couple short videos on uh, carpet rug making. Uh, Weaving talent. Both hands. Handwoven with the finest materials, including wool and silk, a single Persian rug can often take years and sometimes decades to create. A high quality Iranian carpet can cost tens of thousands of dollars, with antique rugs fetching even higher prices. So, how are Persian rugs made and why are they so expensive? Although several countries are associated with the term Persian rug, authentic Persian carpets and the traditional methods of producing them originate in Iran. Every Persian rug is regarded as a piece of art which reflects the history and culture of Iran. There are many varieties of Persian carpet, each distinguished by their materials, patterns and weaving techniques. From the floral designs of Isfahan in central Iran to the intricate fine details of Qum carpets and the strong, compact Bijar rugs from the western Kurdish village. Gabi rugs, made in the Fars province of southwestern Iran, are perhaps the most traditional carpets, characterized by their bold designs. همون چیزی که تو ذهن بافنده هست رو می‌بینید یعنی می‌شینه یه وقتای اینجوری بوده که مثلا می‌نشسته توی حیات خونه‌اش جنگل و کوه و دشت و مزاره و راحت حتی گوسفندها و چیزهای مختلف که می‌دارن نقاشی می‌کرد مثلا گبه از اینجا به وجود اومده Traditionally Persian rugs are made from sheep's wool which is boiled spun and dyed by hand these bright and elaborate yarns are dyed with natural colorings from plants and insects. In many regions, such as Yazd, hundreds of weavers may work in the same factory at any given time. However, here in Fars province, where carpet weaving is recognized as part of the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List, the materials are distributed to small villages for tribal women to weave in their homes. I said, دار همون سایز داشته باشه مثلا طرف خانمی ممکنه خونه کوچیکی داشته باشه دار کوچکتری داره و فرقی که دار فرشای فارس میکنه مخصوصا حالا تو گبه دار و اینو سخت میکنه بافتشو برای بافنده خیلی سخت‌تر میشه اینه که دار فرشای فارس زمینیه فرشای فارس به صورت افقیه یعنی بافنده خیلی باید بیشتر زحمت بکشه از کمرش خیلی اذیت میشه و باید به این صورت the process of weaving a Persian rug differs slightly with each variety, but generally speaking, a bed of foundation material called warp is installed into the frame called the loom. Starting at the bottom, weavers then feed wool in between the warp, tying knots called weft on each one. A highly detailed silk rug can have over a thousand knots per square inch. However, most carpets are not valued based on knot count but rather their materials, design, and overall size. And in the end, every one of the things that are bigger, the time is bigger, and there are times when a gap or a gap, for example, a gap that is very bigger, one person can't be able to offer. It is necessary to have four people, three people, and four people, with them, they have to bring it to the top. Well, this is a gap for example, a gap of 12 meters, if one person wants to be able to offer, دو سال طول بکشه ولی چون چهار نفر با هم شروع میکنن به بافت تقسیم به چهار میشه مثلا میتونه تو 6 ماه هفت ماه این بافته بشه یه متر گبه رو تقریبا بین یک ماه تا دو ماه یه نفر میتونه یک متر گبه بافت Whilst some varieties of Persian rugs follow design specifications gabe carpets are often completely improvised with the weaver adding traditional motifs such as goats trees and dolls 
با فرمول نداره اینو یه باید با گوشت و پوست و استخونتون حس کنید کلکیت زدن رو بافتن فرش رو گره ها رو درست چیز کردن جالب این که کسی که مثلا یه فرش قشقایی خوب میبافه این نمیتونه بره یه فرش تبریز خوب بافه یا اون کسی که یه فرش تبریز عالی میبافه نمیتونه بره یه فرش شاد اصفهان خوب ببافه و جذابیت و با مزه است اینو بدونیم که جالبه که هر منطقه ای یه فرش رو میتونه خوب ببافه The origin of these rugs dates back at least 2500 years ago during the reign of the Persian Empire which spanned across neighboring countries including what is now known as Turkey The legacy and tradition of carpet making still remains there. In fact, in 2018, Turkey exported $1.9 billion of handwoven carpets worldwide, far higher than Iran's total of $35 million. As such, Turkish carpets can sometimes be regarded as authentic Persian rugs. The most expensive Persian rug ever bought was a 17th century Persian vase style carpet, which sold at auction in June 2013 in London for $33.8 million. Wow. But despite Iran's rich history of producing handmade rugs, the tribal rugs produced in rural villages could be under threat from a lack of young weaving talent. Bafande, avvalin pellashe. Ho mutmainan kamtain sud ro mibare ta hay mirase ta bekhayam ino vaqan kho in khali tedad ziyadi hastan ke vasat in az yek az shad ertezaq mikonan az پول این فرش ولی آره بافنده خب چیز کمتر از همه اینا مثلا به هنری که داره گیرش میاد خب این متاسفانه اشکال کاره من میتونم بهتون حالا با این وضعی که میبینیم قول بدم شاید 15 سال دیگه بگم این زودی نهایتاً چیزی از فرش هنریه که همه نمیتونن یادش بگیرن باید تو خود اونها باشن متاسفانه جوانترهاشون دخترها و کسایی که خب توی خونه های اشایرا مثلا مادرش فرش باف وقتشون حوصله شون حسش نمیذارن واسه یه فرش بافتن چون مادرهاشون رو دیدن که چقدر شاد بیمار شدن مریض شدن کمر درد دست درد اینا بله فرش تقریبا تا 15 20 سال دیگه با این سیستم که داره میره جلو comments before I move on to the next uh, two, another one. <clears throat> Sad to see if that happens. Um, they would need to be subsidized. <clears throat> well, when the internet goes down and they lose their cell phones, maybe they'll resume. Yeah. <laughs> huh. I didn't know Turkey was exporting a lot more than Iran. Did you know that, Trashka? No, I didn't. That's amazing. Yeah. 35 million isn't a lot in one year. No, of course, <laughs> with the restrictions, anything. you know, with the yeah. political restrictions they have now, it's difficult. How, <clears throat> how many, how much, was it billion dollars in Turkey that of ca carpets that were sent out? Was that how much it was? Some hiring? I don't think it was billions. So it was, I forget the exact numbers. Well, it was a billion. It was, it was a billion? billion. Yeah. yeah. It was billion. Yeah, it's like they've taken it over. Yeah. Well, they uh, took over uh, a lot of our foods, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it also says the hands. They must get arthritis. They said the knuckles mm, get hard. Can't imagine. Part, yeah, can you imagine doing that all day? In the back. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Um, all right, so this one is traditional Persian rugs. It's four, almost five minutes long. Hi, my name is Zach Siman, and we're at our gallery Heirloom in the North Shore of Long Island. Today we'll be talking about traditional Persian rugs. We'll be focusing on antiques from the late 19th and early 20th century. The origin of rug weaving is obscure at best. The oldest surviving fragment is 2,500 years old. And that piece actually displays an evolution of weaving that predates it by some time. The art form continued to evolve in the 15th century to the 18th century is generally known as the uh, golden age of rug weaving. And this was during the Safavid era and uh, 
what is now modern day Iran. Rugs from the first golden age are very rare and it's unlikely that you'd come across rugs of that age unless you're at a Christie's or Sotheby's auction and then very infrequently as well. But the second age of second golden age of rug weaving was in the late 19th century. That's when there was interest from Europe and America in this this art and rug production was ramped up and we started to see some very good examples of weaving back on the, in the marketplace. This rug right here is an example of a sampler rug. This was created to show the marketplace in Europe and the United States what a larger rug could potentially look like. So they would show the field design here and then a border and how it interacts with the field here. So if the people that were make, taking orders in the United States or Europe like this, they could make a production order of many in this type of style. So this is a great example of a bijar sampler. Bijar was a, a rug woven by Kurdish people in the northwest of Iran. The weaving style of it is very densely packed. For bijars, the weavers would actually wet the wool as they were weaving it. So they'd pack in a lot of extra wool. They call these rugs the iron rug of Persia because of their durability. This next rug is an example of a farahan from western Iran. It's from the turn of the century. It's very finely woven with a good color combination. This Harati pattern is actually a very common pattern and what it displays is a water garden. Surrounding the rosette and diamond in the center are these four symbols, which we call mahi, which is the Persian word for fish. This rug is a mashad from the eastern province of Khorasan in Iran that borders Afghanistan. It's a great example of traditional design in a Persian rug. This rug has a central medallion and a pattern that's actually symmetrical. If you take one quarter of the rug and flip it diagonally or from bottom to top, it's an exact symmetrical replica of that quarter. What's interesting about this rug too is when you get to Eastern Iran, a lot of times you use different dyes. The red of this dye is not matter root, like more commonly found for rugs in the west of Iran. It's actually a dye called cochineal, which is a pigment that's derived from insects. This next rug is a kerman from the 1880s and it's from central Iran. These rugs were very sought after by the European market and they were actually influenced by that demand. The red, the cochineal again, is actually a dye that, that came from the insects that was exported to Iran by European firms. So that really speaks a lot to how much this was influenced by European taste. These type of kermans are called lavar kermans, and that's how people in the trade differentiate a kerman of this quality and age from a more inferior kerman or more common kerman. A lot of the flowers we see in this rug are more European in nature than the traditional palmettes that we see in a lot of the other Persian rugs. This next rug is a Sultanabad. It's from Western Iran and it dates from the late 19th century. These were created in villages and they took a lot from the Safavid uh, motifs and designs. They took the patterns, they enlarged them, they added larger borders, and they added more contemporary colors at the time. So from the period of when these were first created until modern day, these have been some of the most sought after rugs. They go really well with English furniture and American furniture. Everybody from the Guinness family to Adolf Hitler to Sigmund Freud have owned Sultanabads. Thanks for joining us today at Heirloom. I hope you enjoy the traditional Persian rugs. We hope to see you again soon. All right, if you buy one for him, the circle center gets the cut. <laughs> it's disturbing. <laughs> I have a little experience with cochineal. Okay. Um, when I was out in uh, Colorado, I was learning how to dye with the Indian dyes, American Indian dyes. And they told me about cochineal. These are little tiny bugs that are pests on prickly pear cactus. And you go out and you scrape them off. I mean, they're tiny, tiny things. You scrape them off and then you, you die with them. But it was amazing. My husband and I went out on slick rock and trying to dig this stuff off, but it was really neat. Huh. Then when I started working with kids and with dyes, I would order it. <laughs> already freeze-dried cochineal right but it's kind of neat to use it what, uh, say it again i was looking at this sorry what's cochineal the, uh, cochineal is uh what's it made from 
It's it's bugs that ah, are pests right. on prickly pear cactus. And okay. so what yeah, the color red. is the same as the, the red right. and the the yeah. fruit of the prickly pear cactus. Right. They're like beetles, right? They look like beetles. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. But a little goes a long way to make nice right. colors. I, I would get pinks, but not really red reds from right. it. Yeah, it all depends on water and everything. All right, let's look at one more. This one looks interesting. It's just a five minute. Uh, reading rugs, understanding the symbols and images. Let's try that one uh, for the last carpet one. <clears throat> This is a discussion with Margaret Jasper, noted collector and retailer of genuine Persian rugs. Margaret, it's a pretty well-known concept for art connoisseurs to look at the great works of art, great pictures and paintings, and read them and look for various signs and symbols. Is that something that's replicated in the world of Persian rugs? Yes, it occurs over and over again in the Persian rugs, particularly in the tribal work. Well, within the rug, there are many symbols, but the first one that's through all of them and is, other, is in other rugs as well, is the border. You get a border on the, on the rug, which is there in Persian rugs to keep the evil out. And when you get really intricate edges, like this one, the borders, seven borders, it is like a brick wall and a barbed wire fence. Almost all rugs can be interpreted as garden design and many designs are called garden of heaven. The imagery relates to gardens, happiness, prosperity, pleasant thoughts. In a geometric carpet you might see only multi-sided symbols but they are described to me as open flowers. In tribal rugs the imagery is often quite naive and easier to read. Birds are treasured images in carpets, they are seen almost as we might see angels. They are winged creatures, the element that goes between heaven and earth. They can have quite a spiritual meaning in a carpet. Some birds have specific meanings. Peacocks, for instance, are seen as a representation of wealth, even of royalty. Doves are good luck. Colour is interesting. For instance, green is a holy colour and used sparingly. Yellow is to keep out the devil. The bote symbol occurs a lot. It could be described as a paisley shape. It translates to seed of life. It symbolises hope, growth, potential of good things to come, like the coming of wealth. It's a very happy symbol to have in a carpet and to an Iranian it is a strong symbol to have. The tree of life symbol is in many carpets. It's a recognition of your life and the wish for a long, healthy, fruitful, happy life. Carpets with a lot of flowers are always gardens. The Bakhtiari tribes have a design that represents the old Persian gardens that were divided into rectangles with rills of running water. And so you get squares on the carpet with flower design inside each square. Prayer rugs have a pointer in the design to direct towards Mecca when you pray. The field of some of those rugs are full of beautiful flowers and the design is called hallway to heaven. There are many, many symbols in carpets, particularly with the tribal work. In the tribal work, they will involve the family, the work they do, and the images are often of what they see around them. So for instance, you have the sheep and the goats and dad looking after them. You've got the tent and the camel with its camel cloth on it and even the flowers that are the wildflowers out in the middle of the desert. So Margaret, are you saying that there are sometimes very significant messages contained in carpets? We had a Russian doctor in one time and she was talking about this particular rug here and she was saying how it represented a reconciliation. She called it a reconciliation carpet, where you had this is a group of people and this is a group of people. And they each came into the centre, into a neutral ground to discuss their problems. And then they went back out again, having resolved their differences. She looked at a 
another one which was different, had the same symbolism in it, but was different end to end. So one end had a lot more symbols in it than the other. And she said it was a record of a marriage pact in terms of what property was brought in by each party into the marriage. And so the big circles represented cows and the small circles represented sheep and everybody knew what the prenup was. we could spend uh, a lot more time on carpets and carpet making. But, um, any other comments? You want to go on a, just a few on the calligraphy? But any other comments about carpets, rugs, rugs you may have owned? I, I learned something, which is that border is about keeping the evil out. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Know that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Did you know about the reconciliation ones or the marriage? Yeah, I had heard that. Yeah. You had heard that, right. Yeah. Um, but they've gotten the good ones have gotten so expensive. I mean, I guess 30, 40 years ago, you could buy one. But I don't know about now. You can still find bargains, I think. We have a, a rug dealer over in, um, in the mall where the Circle Center is. Uh -huh. I don't know how long they're going to be in business because of COVID, but right. um, they have some nice selections there. All right, look at that. Uh, oh, is somebody off? Is someone saying something? I, I was saying I have a rug I bought in Morocco, oh. and the experience was what was the wonderful thing for me. Bargaining and seeing yeah. and all of that. I, I absolutely adore my rug and the memories that it brought to me. Yeah, I had a I had a one from India like that. You know, it wasn't real valuable. It was it was one I had bargained for in, in Pune and had for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love this rug. You still have it? You have it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's in my living room. What color? I guess I color? could show you a picture. Let me think. How can what? I do this? What's the main uh, color? The main color is turquoise. Turquoise, right. All right, I'm going to see if I can show a picture of it. All right. I'm going to go off. Can you see it? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's my rug. And now I'll look at it differently with a little more knowledge. Oh, man, okay. But it, I mean, it, it wasn't the cost of what they did, said, but you did have to bargain and they told us to do that. So it was really, it was a fun experience. And my friends who were there refused to bargain, so they didn't get a rug. <laughs> I mean, they just said, well, tell us about a price. And they said, no, we can't do that. So they didn't have any fun or any memory. So it is in my will that she receives the carpet if I <laughs> die first. Yeah, and bargaining is just a given and, and uh... Middle Absolutely. East, that's what they'll set the price high, and then you, you yeah. Yeah. When can you show it again? I only saw it in a little tiny square in the gallery. Can you? I can't see it. I couldn't really. You see mean it. mine? Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can move some stuff. Uh, I don't know. Is well, if, if Joe can she do that, that Joe? When there's yeah. Well, uh, I'm gonna move stuff that's on top of it. Sorry. No, it's just that it's such a small image on my screen. It's just in gallery view, which is about oh. one and three quarters by one. Oh my gosh. I mean, did anybody Thank else you. see it larger? Um, yeah. All right, I, wait a oh, there, I'm going to take sorry. a picture of it. Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, okay. look at the aquas. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh my yeah. goodness. That's hold the camera still. Just hold it still for a minute. Joe can spotlight her. Joe, do you know how to spotlight people? Uh, wait a minute. Because then she takes up the screen even if somebody else is talking. Yeah. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, da, 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 da. Spotlight, uh, for, spotlight for everyone? Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know how to do it. There you go. 
There you go. Yay! So try to hold your camera still. Just hold it still for a minute. Yeah. All right. Yeah, beautiful can you, color. Can you can go down a little bit to the middle part? So we can, the middle. Back the up. Middle. Back, back, back up. This is the middle. The uh -huh. white. And then on either side is this image. Yeah, that's the one that's interesting. Can you make that center and so we can see the whole shape? I don't know. See, I'm 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 upside down. There you <laughs> go. That's better. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> can you move it up? Can you move away from it. I mean well, down. Can up. you move it? Yeah. There we go. Now it's centered. Yeah. Okay. So wow, that's nice. I I, I just love it. Let me show you the edge. It kind of looks like a modified thunderbird huh. and uh, i like the cream colors i like the soft pastel yeah oh look at those open hearts those are beautiful yeah and there's like uh, pinkish grays there's yeah little pastel that, that looks like a puzzle the pinkish what's, gray <laughs> what's the size of it i'd say about three by five that's what i was going to say three by five so yeah so that's something you could travel with yeah. Where, Joanne, where did you say you bought it? Uh, I'm going to turn around. <laughs> she said Morocco. Bought it in uh, Marrakesh, Marrakesh, Morocco. Oh, no. yeah. And they were using that aqua color there. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, the experience was so wonderful. <laughs> I mean, how long did it take you to get your price? Like 20 minutes, half hour? How long oh, at least, yeah. And we had tea. I have pictures of us buying it, but we <laughs> had tea that they gave us. And my husband just shut up and let me do it all because I loved it so much. But um, it's harder and harder. Know. If you're into that bargaining process for 20 minutes, it's almost impossible to say, to change your mind, say, I don't want to buy it. He's pulled oh, out. Gosh, no. Well, I, I knew and I knew more or less what it would cost. So. I went that way, but He's I just love this carpet and love the experience of it. And now that I'm learning about way things mean things, that's even neater to look at it. Cool. Yeah. Elizabeth is showing yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, I thought this was Turkish, but it's actually from Tunisia. But the turquoise color is just really gorgeous in it. Can you see it? And oh, actually, uh, that shape looks like a similar shape to one of those rugs. Oh, where'd you get that, Elizabeth? I bought it from somebody selling oh. international stuff. It's made by Le Souk in Tunisia. So I guess Le Souk would be a bazaar. So it came from right. someplace in Tunisia. It's, oh, it's a bowl, right? It's a bowl, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's a long bowl. It's actually for fish. Right. Uh, oh, it's I beautiful it for bananas and squash and things like that. Nice. Yeah, oh. uh, it's fine. Okay, she's got her bowl here. Oh, that's pretty. Oh, I love that. Look at that one. Oh, yes. Who's, who's are you looking at? Oh, that is pretty. Fair stay. Where, where did you? Uh, this uh, one. Uh, from how do we Iran. get her? I brought, I brought a few plates. Like how am I still on? I want to see other people's. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh, that's gorgeous. Wow. Joe yeah. has you on spotlight. Yeah, oh, has, has, I want to be unspotted. <laughs> I, I, see, I, don't know, I don't know how to unspot you. Actually, where was that name. made? What part of Iran? Isfahan. Isfahan. Are they, do you know anything about the symbolism? The green and the blue on the outside and the middle? No, more, I don't. Uh, but it's a mandala. Basically, a lot of these plates are uh, mandala shape. I, I haven't studied the symbology at all. Uh, there's well, some I'm... birds in the middle. And um, uh, this this is hand painted, really. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Perfect. Yeah. Anyway, we can do more show and tell if there's time. I have three or four carpets here. I can show you guys. Oh, that's nice. Hey, yeah, you want to show us one? Go for it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Which one? Do you want to see the round one or the, okay. Well, there's stuff on this one, but it's very pretty. I right, guess, so how do I get you on? on, on... Um, just go hover around my name and, and replace spotlight. <laughs> Like okay. you did. I want to get Suzanne off. Off. Let's see. Bye. 
stop, stop this doing is going to be tough with a. Oh wow! Look Ooh. at that. That's gorgeous. Beautiful. Wow. It's kind of a red rose. That came, that came that's that's my... one of the ones they talked about, but I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, um, I can't either. But this one is has been in my family for a long time, it, certainly since I was born, and that's been wow. sixty years. And I'm sure my parents had it <laughs> way before then. Mm. So I had to schlep it all the way here because, you know, I just gorgeous. Keep, yeah. And there's another one in the, on, under the dining room table. That's easier, harder to show. But this this little one is uh, more round. Oh, wow. Oh, beautiful. So pretty. I love that color. You. It's kind of like yes. a seafoam color. These are uh, all very tightly woven. And he said the price was based on that, but that was false. The price is very much based on how tight the weave is. And them are knots per square inch or something, right? Yeah. 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 That's, that's one of the primary things, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> um, give us your address. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> You've been here, Joe. You just didn't notice. <laughs> Make sure you lock your door. I have a nice, I have a nice fake one. I have, I have a nice fake one from Home, home Goods. <laughs> right, for home goods. Petroleum. I have a couple of rugs, but I don't know if they're from Persia. I don't think from they Walmart. are. Right. Okay, so, all right, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Still a little um, calligraphy here. <clears throat> Oh, the internet's slow. <clears throat> Come on. I mean, it's up already. No? Joe, just... when you were showing those miniatures, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> how big are they in real life? I, I have a miniature Hafez and it's got paintings like that in it. I think they're about, uh, I think they're about page to... size. Size of a book. That, you know, that's a book. Um, then they they started off as manuscript size, maybe I don't know what octo size. Pardon? Octo size, you know, like they would have the octavo I'm not, I'm not size. Sure that, I'm not sure what that is, um, but I know they were originally for books, so whatever, however large those books were, and then they became an art form in themselves. But I don't think they ever got uh, the traditional ones. I don't think they ever got too large. Um, so, so in case anyone's interested, this is my miniature Hafiz. Can okay. you see this? I got to go off stop share again. Oh, hold on. This this is the miniature. Why can't it doesn't it show it? Here's the the miniature book. Uh, oh, back to, up a little. I have to make Elizabeth. myself. I don't know how to. Okay, here we go. And then on the inside. I think these might be miniatures, but I'm not 100% sure. Let me find. So you can see it's in Farsi. And um, <laughs> okay, now when I'm trying to find here, here's one of the images. Yeah, right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. They're not as beautiful as some of the ones that you showed. And then, um, but they're every, they're every few pages. Here's another one. My book is falling apart. Right. Oh, that that was probably what you're what you have maybe the smallest that they would go, a real a real miniature, and then probably up to a larger maybe. Yeah, um, I got this from somebody who was from Iran. Where did where did you get that? My old boyfriend, Mahmoud Kushesh, uh -huh. gave it to me. He used to read it to me. I would yeah. make him read it if he didn't volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> he would read it and then translate. Here's one, a woman with a lute, which is really pretty. All right. How old is that book? Oh, so 1979 or 80. So, oh, oh, but I don't know how long he, I mean, it was his wow. and he just gave it to me. So I really have no idea how old it, it really is. It looks like a very old book. There's no date on it. It looks like it's from the 19th century. 
Yeah, it looks old. And, uh, you know, if you can show, uh, send me, email me the first page of it where there's a date. Might look like a date. I can tell you how old it is. So would that be the back of the book or the front of the book? <laughs> the front from right to left. Here, here. Okay, hold on. Okay, 13, 20, 21. So that would be, I was born in 1337, which is 1958. So can somebody do the math? 13, right. 13, Wait a minute, say 20, that again, what you just said. I can figure out the math. You were born in 1330, 20, right. 1335, I think it says 13, no. 1325 or 21. Let's say 1325. So that's about and 70 were, some years old, that book. Wow. And what does the title say? Coliote. Uh, well, the, the, it's basically the um, Divan of Hafez of Shira, from Shiraz. But it's uh, brought together by some Shams. Mr. Shamsuddin Muhammad or something like that. And it's it also uh, writes the publisher and the date. And you think it was 19? Yeah, 37 minus 25, 12 years, uh, add 12 years to my age. So it's probably 75 years old. Yeah. So 12 added to whatever your age is. It looks older. So. Well, it needs to be fixed. Yeah, yeah, book is 75 years old. Yeah, I could use some uh, maintenance work here. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> for That's nice. You're welcome. Yeah. I don't know how to fix it, though. <laughs> well, you, gotta go, you would have to go to a book finder in New York City or something to fix that up. I don't think there's anyone around. Or wherever you live. I know how to do it. I do. Mm -hmm. I do, do take care of Baba, old Baba books. Okay, there you go. She said she could do it. <laughs> All right, let's uh, Joe, Joe. Yeah. yeah. Could I just tell her she can call me? I I know a man that does beautiful restoration. He's done for me on old books. Uh huh. Okay. Nice. You want me to give you my number? No. Sure. Unless Farish Day wants to do it, either person is. I mean, uh, I would I'll like to get real cheap. I'll be real cheap as in okay <laughs> this this is not cheap but, but okay this person is professional I'm sure he's gonna he's gonna do a better job than me <laughs> I'll just write down uh, first I have your number what is who is the person who's gonna give me a number um Erm, do have, did you hear me Erm? I R M no I R M that's okay. my first name Last uh -huh. name is Kate, C-A-T-E. Erm Kate, okay. Okay. The number is 843-357-7299. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so let's look a little bit at the calligraphy. Uh -huh. For more than 1400 years, Muslims have considered calligraphy to be their highest form of visual art. This art form is known by some as Islamic calligraphy. It can also be called Arabic, Ottoman or Persian calligraphy, depending on the work style, the language used and the place of origin. Many of the finest examples of calligraphy are passages from the Qur'an, the holy book of Islam. However, calligraphy is not only limited to spiritual works. It can also be used to write poetry, royal decrees, stories, proverbs, and many other types of things. The Arabic alphabet is used to write Arabic. Persian, Ottoman Turkish, 
Urdu, Pashto, Sindhi, Malay, Kurdish and many other languages. After the Latin alphabet, it is the second most widely used alphabet in the world. The Arabic alphabet has 28 letters, all representing consonant, and is written from right to left. Letters in the same word are connected to each other. Some letters share the same base shape. In these cases, dots above and below the shape differentiate the letters from one another. In order to accommodate the needs of other languages, new letters and other symbols were added to the original alphabet. Each letter of the Arabic alphabet changes depending on where the letter falls within the word. In this example, the highlighted shapes are different forms of the letter Ba. Just like in Latin calligraphy, there are many different styles of Arabic, Ottoman and Persian calligraphy. The different styles are called scripts. Each script has distinctive shapes and characteristics. Good calligraphy is the perfect harmony between control and freedom. Elinor Aisha Holland is a teacher and a student of both Arabic and Latin script calligraphy. Arabic, Ottoman and Persian calligraphy is written using a reed pen. After the pen has been aged and treated, it is carved and the end is then slit in the middle to allow it to hold more ink. Finally, the tip is cut at an angle. The letters are typically written in lamp black ink made from soot. This ink stays black for centuries if correctly prepared. The paper used for calligraphy should be coated and smooth. Traditionally, this paper is dyed, treated with several surfacing agents, and then burnished. Calligraphy can be written on many different surfaces, such as paper or parchment, objects or buildings. In a calligraphy composition, dots help the reader differentiate between letters that share the same base shape. Diacritical marks indicating vowels can be used above and below the letters to help with pronunciation. Decorative marks are sometimes used to ornament a composition. Words in a calligraphy composition may overlap each other. The calligraphy form of a letter can look different than regular handwriting. With time and practice, however, good calligraphy can be read with ease. You better let the pen do the work. The process of learning to write calligraphy differs by region. In the Arab and Ottoman tradition, students study individually with a master calligrapher. Muhammad Zakaria is one of the few master calligraphers who live in the United States. He is a well-established calligraphy artist, known particularly for his work on the popular Eid U.S. postage stamp. Students begin their studies by writing a supplication in Arabic called Rabbi Yassir. Translated, this phrase means, Lord, make it easy and do not make it difficult. Lord, may it end in goodness. Next, the student learns to write the individual letters of the alphabet. After that, come letter combinations, and then the student moves on to write complete words and phrases. Typically, the student visits the master at least once a week, and the master corrects the student's work in red ink. When the student has completed all the lessons to the master's satisfaction, he or she will be eligible for an ijaza or certificate which will enable him or her to teach others. There are many modern artists using calligraphy in their work. 
These pieces include everything from traditional calligraphy compositions to multimedia creations and digital art. Please explore calligraphyqalam.com. Meet teachers and students of calligraphy, learn more about the different scripts, and test your knowledge of this exceptional art form. Anybody ever study it or write it? Do you know? Yeah, we uh, had to do it in school, actually. It was yeah. part of our curriculum in Iran. In high school? Uh, yes. Grade school? Elementary school? Mm -hmm. Huh. It is so beautiful. Yeah, amazing. Last time I was in Iran, I went to the bazaar um, to get some pens and ink and so forth. And oh my God, that was so fun. Huh. I found this little out of the way hole in the wall and you walk in and the guy is all about, you know, uh, inks and uh, bamboo pens and the yeah. whole variety, the smell there and just the atmosphere. And while we, I was shopping, this guy just waltzes in there and starts uh, playing an instrument. <laughs> and I was just sitting there, just bawling my eyes out. It was just so beautiful. That was one one highlight. Thanks for reminding me of that memory. <laughs> that would be a good story, Farish Day. That's a beautiful story. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, yeah. Uh, since it's going right to left, I, it like I it. took it as Baba's. Uh, I, sorry, I, I said I took it as definitely a Baba gift. <laughs> what year was that? Um, last time I was in it, maybe four or five years ago, uh -huh. Cheryl. How wonderful. Yeah. I, I haven't been in Iran, but I have been in Turkey. And when I was in Istanbul, we had an afternoon free to go shopping. And I thought, I haven't traveled here finally to go shopping. So I wandered around and I was wandering by foot by myself in an um, old section of um, which I would like to call Constantinople, but anyway, Istanbul. And I came across this huge um, plate glass uh, storefront. And up above, it was just, I assume now from what was being said in Arabic, but it looked Persian to me. That's what I thought. And I just stood there for a while and I thought, should I go in? And I pushed my face against the glass and there was only one man there. And when I came in, he went behind the counter and he refused to speak English to begin with. And uh, obviously I was English speaking. And there I looked in the walls and there were this, this incredible calligraphic images all over the walls framed. And I asked him what it what the what they were and he didn't answer right away but since i guess i seemed really sincere which i was because i was stunned by them he said that they were the meditations that students did in the school meditations on the name of god and mm -hmm. on different mm -hmm. texts from um he didn't say he didn't say where they were but different texts so i was one that really stood out to me it was like it was so powerful and i said um what and so he then it turned out he could speak a little english <laughs> as we talked and i said what does that mean because they all had inscriptions underneath them and i said what is the title of that one and what blew me away is guess what the title of that one was and where are they happy? the oh, wow. everything and the nothing Really? Wow. And right. that just stunned me. And I really wanted to buy it. And I said, how much is it? And because there was no one with me who could bargain. And I, he said 300 US dollars because I had told him by this point I was from the US. Right. And I said, is there any chance it could be less than that? And he said, absolutely not. But he didn't use the word absolutely. And I still long to have that. And it, it was circular. You showed a circular pattern, either Fereshte did or you did, Joe, in one of the you know, YouTube things you were showing. And it was all of this calligraphy in circle. And what blew my mind was they were meditations. They were from students in the school and they were meditations on God. And calligraphy is one of the way of meditate, one of the ways of meditating, which I think is, good. and I still to this day would love to have that <laughs> piece. <laughs> so, um, yeah. He got his business card, maybe. Um, yeah, I, you know, <laughs> I would, I think I'd have to go back to Istanbul, but 
I just, I mean, while you were showing today in this meeting, I felt like if I could ever go back, I would go try and find, I was just wandering the streets. It was a very, very narrow street. They're very narrow streets. And I don't know how the buses, the tourist buses get down them, but they seem to. But there was nobody else around. He was the only one in the store. I was the only person there. It was just so cool. Talk about memories. I would find one of, the things I regret, one of the things I regret when I was in India for five years, I'd have to leave the country every six months. And um, I could have gone to Turkey, to Istanbul for three months. And uh, this one, I chose uh, Malaysia, and which I didn't, which was boring. Um, so I, I really wish I'd done that. I spent half the time in Greece, half the time in uh, Istanbul. Oh, well. Do, do I have time hey, to tell another Cheryl, one? Cheryl, maybe the guy didn't speak to you because it was against his... Uh, religious um, orthodoxy. Yeah, Not I don't know. He finally woman. started speaking a little bit. I think you know it was just that animosity towards the West. But I, you know, that's my sense. If I had had someone Persian speaking or Arabic speaking with me, and I had disappeared, I think it would have been a lot less money, and you know, I could have done it. But I didn't have. There were. I didn't have a credit card in those days. This was back in nineteen. Yeah, he says absolutely not. That's. You don't take that as literal, right? Fresh day. I mean, that's the starting point, and you go from there. No, if that's the price, he said. You know how he said? He said that's the price. Yeah. So what? So that's then, no, those are the word. That's the price. It, it just came to me. Stand there and you lowball him, and then he, he, he. That's that's the that's just the the uh, how they do it. Yeah, they're not gonna they're not gonna give you a, uh, an opening right off. And you gotta, May I tell you one more story? Do we have time, or do you need to move on? Um, there's a couple other things I'd like to cover. And okay, well then I'll I'll just wait till another time. It's about seeing the hair of the head of Muhammad, and it right. was in a museum, and they had it guarded with at least six men with rifles. But there's a whole story to it. I mean, little details, but that was phenomenal. To see. we didn't see the hair that was all in a box within a box within a box, and it had 12 feet of bulletproof glass in front of it. And before the bulletproof, uh, 12 inches, I'm sorry, 12 inches of bulletproof glass, these six guards with rifles and a whole cordon in front of the bulletproof glass. That was how they were guarding in a museum there. The a sword that had been. I'll just say it briefly, a sword that had been given a scabbard by one of the Mughal emperors that was bejeweled, it was phenomenal. So there was a sword there, one of the, uh, the hair of, of Muhammad and then um, a piece of his sadra, which was also, you couldn't see, but they said that that's what it was. It was in a, in a bejeweled box. And that was just extraordinarily powerful to stand before. Before I found out what was in the third box, which was the one hair of the head of Muhammad, I felt this energy coming through me. I mean, I was like pulled magnetically. And that's what I started answering. And one of the guards answered very quickly who didn't pretend he didn't know English. <laughs> and so that was a phenomenal experience too. Oh, that was in Istanbul. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, all right. For us Muslims, the Holy Quran is the holiest book of all time. Unlike the Christian and Hebrew Bibles that contain sacred events and texts, the Holy Quran contains the exact words of God that were revealed to the Messenger of Islam. That's why it's known as a miracle. Since the Prophet of Islam passed away some 1,385 years ago, Muslims from around the world have been paying tribute to the Holy Quran one way or the other. We're here at the National Museum of Malik in Tehran to take a look at the many ancient manuscripts of the Quran on display. For over 1,400 years, Muslims have copied the verses of the Quran with beautiful calligraphy as a means of expressing their love and belief in the divine and the unseen.
Have you ever heard the term Islamic calligraphy? It's the artistic rendition of the handwriting prevalent in different Islamic lands and includes Arabic, Old Turkish and Persian. The emergence of Islamic calligraphy was of course strongly tied to the Quran. Early copies of the Quran are important because they are proof of the development of the written records. The original Quranic scripts were written in Kufic, which probably got its name from a town called Kufa in Iraq. The Kufic Qurans of the 9th and 10th centuries were characterized by the use of red dots in them to represent the vowels of the text. As Islam took root beyond the Arabian Peninsula, it became necessary to establish a standard text. A beautiful cursive style called Nasr first appeared in the 10th century and it has three variations, Thuluth, Riqa and Muhaqqaq. Even though all the Qurans in the world have an identical text, the mastery and Islamic calligraphy used in some copies have turned them into unique works of art. The Baisongori Quran is a really good example since it's one of the largest and historic handwritten Qurans out there. قرآن به لحاظ خط و به لحاظ کاغذ سازی بسیار حائز اهمیت هست. این قرآن به خط محقق نوشته شده و چیزی که مورد توجه کارشناسان هست علاوه بر خطش کاغذ اون هست که در اون شرایط این کاغذ درست شده. این قرآن در ابعاد 105 در 187 تهیه شده و یکی از شاهکارهای هنر کتابارایی در ایران هست. Muhaqaq is a majestic style used by accomplished calligraphers and was considered to be one of the most beautiful and difficult scripts to execute. Unfortunately, the general use of this style lessened from the 18th century onwards. If you take a second to think how long it must have taken to write these beautiful scripts, you'd be astonished. And just like any other unique antique work of art, many different stories surround the creation of this Quran. This copy of Quran was not written by one person. There are at least three different handwritings here, according to the width of their pens, the way they run on the page, according to the transmissions on this page, and the graphical form of the work. We can distinguish at least three different handwritings. According to one story, this Quran was written by a Timurid prince, Qiyasuddin Baisongol, also known as Baisongol Mirza in the 14th century. It's said that he was known as a prominent calligrapher as well as a patron of art, architecture and Persian miniature. As another story goes, during the Timurid period, Omar Akhtar, who was a renowned calligrapher, wrote a miniature Quran so small that it could fit under the gem of a ring in its entirety. Apparently, the king Sultan Sahib Qaran was so offended by the small size of the script that he ordered Omar Akhtar's hand to be cut off. Omar Akhtar's reaction to this enormous injustice was to use his left hand to write the largest copy of the Quran ever written and present it to the court, forcing the king to acknowledge what a great calligrapher he had been. Now, suppose that I'm left-handed. When I get here, I can no longer see. My hand is blocking my view. So I have to leave it at some point and draw this line from above and join it. Now, the junction of these two for a left-handed person is the weakest part of the work. And when you look at the places where this has happened, like here, these are the weakest parts of the writing. It's thinner, has weak and lanky stems, and has visibly been corrected with the tip of the pen. Therefore, this shows that the calligrapher was left-handed. I was going to ask about that, since I'm left-handed. I thought maybe it would be, since you're going right to left, it would be ideal for left-handed. So I guess it, it's not. It runs into problems. When a writer steps out of his or her comfort zone, they are bound to make one or two mistakes, no matter how small or insignificant they may be. 
It's by spotting these mistakes that the experts can prove that the Baishongori Quran was not written by just one person. For example, you can see these in the Muhaqqaq script that are called transmission, like the V or Vav and the Re, which are drawn and look like a sword, whereas in the Tuluth script it goes upwards. This was written by someone whose hand was more used to writing in the Tuluth script. Can you see the word Zaytun or Olive? That Z is written in Tuluth. Considering the size of the words and the length of each sentence, it is estimated that the Baisongori Quran would have probably had around 800 or 900 pages if it were still intact. But unfortunately, most of the pages have been lost to us over the years. Maybe if we had all the missing pages of the Baisongori Quran at hand, we could dig deeper and uncover the mysteries of its past. But for now, we have to be content with what we have managed to gather and preserve. This is Gulnaf Anudi for Iran. <coughs> All right, so, any comments on that? When it comes to all... Uh, do you want to watch another one? Or the, the, what I have remaining is um, 10 contemporary Iranian artists, some information and images from them, which uh, 315 we can, would take up the rest of the time. Um, yes, please. You want to do that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, so let's uh, jump into the present. Ten contemporary Iranian artists, and I'll look at some of their work. Does this come from a book, Joe? What? The things you're clicking on, it looks like it's codified. Oh, no, what I do is, like, ahead of time, I go and copy and paste the, the YouTubes into this document, so I don't have to go into my into my save thing it's quicker yeah oh, so, so, okay. I, so i'm yeah i'm creating this ahead of time and it's, it really speeds things up to do this this okay. so it's so, like a bibliography yeah these are the things i looked at and yesterday this morning today um so that i can jump to them real quickly during during these two hours yeah yeah great yeah well it took me a few took me several months to figure this out i mean it's it's like, why? Oh, it's so obvious. Why didn't I think of it before? But that's what I'm doing now. And it's really much faster. Yeah, I just copy and paste them into the, into the YouTube. All right, 10 Iranian artists are shaping contemporary art. Iranian art has, has been um, uh, some real, it's been very influential in the modern art movement, New York, in Iran, LA, you name it. So. For some of the main people, it says um, Iran can be arguably considered one of the most prolific and progressive countries when it comes to art. The country's recent history is filled with artists seeking to create a visual language that is native yet modern. Um, it's been associated with visual poetry, subtlety of expression, penetrating intelligence. Iranian contemporary artists inside the country and its diaspora have been using the power of art to break conventions, pierce through stereotypes and critically examine and challenge their own society and the world more broadly. Uh, <clears throat> so now more than any other moment, Iranian artists are developing a universal discourse to build a place for their work within the global art scene. At the same time, they're shredding the expectations, restrictions, and labels that long rule Iranian creativity. Um, this list of artists brings together emerging and established Iranian artists working within the country and beyond its borders. Um, their work offers a fresh introduction to this exciting and underrecognized art scene. So um, here, here we go. And, um, Nazgul Ansarinia. And uh, <clears throat> Hemp's of Building a Wall. Uh, her works are often directly inspired by the transformations of urban life and the fast changing landscapes of her hometown. Let me see if I got more on her. Um, 
you could be an as what's as well, I think that's her harm. Um as well as her um, this one. <clears throat> so all right whoops yeah there you go um <clears throat> so digital video Book made of clothes used for painting. I should do that. I'm not such a mess in my pink clothes. Pink mattress. Any bird lines, any human lines, bird deterrent spikes, wire razor. Hey. All right, so all very contemporary. <clears throat> that about refugees must be well it says any bird lines any human lines uh, um <clears throat> yeah borders prisons exclusion zones odd infinitum yeah you got it <clears throat> Stay away, stay out, you know. Uh, the weight that counts, all right. Oh, that's someone different, doesn't Jenny Fields? So this is not her. Okay, it's one of them. Might be easier just to stay on this. I think it'd be faster if I stay on this and then go to each individual and what the time is left rather than jumping back and forth. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't have any. Okay, so we left it there. Second one, Abish, I can't pronounce, uh, Fresh, can you pronounce that name, last name? Um, Gabriel Zazda. Avish uh, Kebrezade. Right. Okay. Yeah, right. All right. 60, born in 69. Uh, lives and work in Washington. Um, his, I, actually, this artist interests me the least, or else they just don't show up that well on the internet. So I didn't do, I didn't make any, I didn't go to the website for this person, but okay. Ah, keeps doing that. Keeps jumping out. I stopped doing that. What does it say? To, what does it read underneath there? It's too small to see. Hold on, let me go back to him. With that artist? Yeah, I just want to know what the name, what, what name he gave it. Oh, it's all us, so old, so new. Um, it's, uh, his artwork's imbued with her experiences of migration and living in different countries. Um, dislocation, suspension, mystery, and estrangement of prisoners striking at Mel Connick work. This is uh, Avish Kebre. Yeah. Hasday. Hasday. Yeah. Did I say that right? First day. Right. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, I've tried clicking on these view slideshow and it doesn't work. So I won't bother doing that. I've tried this. That would have made it easier. Um, mm. Okay. Um, but uh, she presented her work in worldwide institutions, Rhode Island, uh, Rhode Island School of Design. And then in 2003, she was awarded the gold mine for the best young Italian artist. Uh, YZ Kami, he's a painter and um, he was, when was he born? 656, lives and works in New York. And so he has a style of painting portraits, which is like, uh, um, there's a, a diffuse quality to the, intentionally to the work. Let's see. So are those paintings or are yeah, those? Most, they're paintings, yeah, yeah. Man with violin. Do you have so. any idea how they do that, that blurry? Yeah, well, look at it, hold on. Uh, he pursues an art historic to identify abstraction, mystery, mysticism, and medium. Um, let's see, he got some international acclaim for his large scale portraits. His meditative, intensely direct piece or pieces offer viewers an emotional encounter with his so uh, it's called Sumato, the portrait of direct expressions, expressions of the contradiction between the familiar and unfamiliar. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a way of, of uh, just uh, you're intentionally blurring as you're doing it, as you're painting, and maybe puts a final, like a, a, a gray cast over it, so it's a single color of gray, or maybe it could be a violet that also does the same thing. Um, it looks like it's a, a photograph that's hazy. I mean, that's not clear. Right, right. Uh, let's go to his, since we're looking at him, let's go to his, uh, um, here. Uh, Joe, you can also uh, right click, I mean, click on it and go to link directly. Well, um, um, how do you do that? But it's not, if I click on it, it's not working. It doesn't go. So, oh, it doesn't. Yeah, now I try that. It should. It should, but it doesn't right now. <clears throat> Geometry of light, KZ, a YZ coming. And there's a slideshow. Here you go. Yeah. Today, man, trying to warm up with hot chocolate. <laughs> uh, white. Um, this this kind of suggests the uh, mecca to me. It's kind of I think another one is black, but the circle, circles of people. <clears throat> we can't really. Oh, see you can't anything. see anything. You can't. Not really. No. Um, nothing. Can, can, the contrast. Can you zoom in on it. Nothing showing up. Well, no, just go back to that white image and, and zoom in on it. If yeah, it's, it's very subtle. You can see it's yeah. circular. It's very, I was told by an artist in New York that it's very, very difficult to draw a perfect circle. And that's what that is. It's a series of circles. Mm -hmm. mm. It's really beautiful. You have to look at it carefully. Yeah, back to that. Uh, yeah. My of, eyes must not be good enough. I it's think that's how he meant it to be. Yeah, there's also a, uh, I thought it was here, a dark version of this, of that. At least I saw it before, I don't see it now. It, it looks been. like a hurricane, uh, the center of a, a yeah. hurricane tornado. But, um, uh, Funny, because I see the sun emanating out. <laughs> what, I got, what I got was Mecca. And the, this is a Rosarch yeah. test, and you yeah. thought it was Mecca, which is a good one, too. Yeah. And I, I see thought it. it was. I thought it was the moon. <laughs> that was the moon, right? Where is the? Where is that? Y Z Cami. Painting. Let me see if it's here. Because there was other paintings. But... <clears throat> yeah, there's the white on white circle. I like color so much, it's hard for me to appreciate the ones that are so oh, here, here, it is. Here, here it is, that's the one I was thinking. Uh -huh. It's a black version of that with the black. That's, this totally reminds me of that, with the circles of... Um, 
the bullseye. With the pilgrims, and this is the the. Um, what's it called? The, what's it called? The blacks. Kaaba. The black hole. What's it called? The first day. Kaaba. The Kaaba. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh. The, this totally reminds me of Mecca. This one. Yeah. All right. Um, Q U Q Tub K U T U B the center. Right? Sorry, I have to go jump back and forth, but um, three thirty. Okay. Okay, Mohammed Hossein Iman, 1957, lives and works in Tehran. And he does um, furniture, sculpture. He's one of the most celebrated Iranian sculptors. He creates highly imaginative and abstract art. Um, He's, he's trained a generation of Iranian sculptors. He's a recipient of many awards, including an honorary diploma from the fourth Tehran Contemporary Sculpture Biennial, and then was selected as Artist of the Year at the same event. He's been commissioned to create public art for spaces across Iran, including Tehran's um, Goftaman Park and Shahid Bahashti University. <clears throat> and uh, this one is, uh, oops. Meg, Meg Dai Lukor, and um, she lives and works in Tehran, born in 83. Uh, one of the most promising new voices in Tehran's artistic scene, she creates paintings that are enigmatic at times, mysterious, uh, using acrylic like color pal, pal. Oh, he, he portrays subjects including still lives. <clears throat> Whenever I guess that was a male name, but yes. And then if there's time left over, I went to their to the galleries, etc. So instead of jumping back and forth, I'll just pass through there. Let's see. And this name is uh Parastu Farahar, uh, born in 62, lives and works in Germany. <clears throat> uh, creates some of the most searing political works among Iranian artists working today. She is the daughter of a well-known secular activist parents who were both brutally assassinated in their home in 98. Her works are deeply charged with the suffering she has endured for over 20 years. Uh, her deeply emotional installations often consist of repetitive texts, forms, and signs through which she finds catharsis. Uh, <clears throat> she writes Persian texts all over the walls of exhibition spaces. These texts follow the traditions of calligraphy, but do they not harbor any specific or tangible meaning? They're intended to convey a sense of liberation from restraints. Um, and then uh, Tala Madani, uh, born in 81, lives and works in, L and works in LA. And this one has kind of broken some uh, traditional restrictions around sexuality, as you can see. Um, and this one's called Sex Ed by God. <laughs> we can't, you need to pin them. We can't see them. You see that? I can see it in the corner, but not like in the screen, you know? I've got it centered on my screen. No, it's not on my screen. Uh... Let me uh, see. How about change other people? Your view, change your view to. Uh, I can. I can see it. I can. I can see the stuff around it. It's not full uh -huh. screen. I got it now. I have it now. Got it now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. What is he pulling off his face? I don't know. Bubble um, gum. Um, his own face. Yeah, his lift, face in front of him. Lifts her out here. It looks like um. What are the? What do they call them in uh? Harry Potter, <laughs> a wrath. Looks oh. like a wrath has gotten him. <laughs> uh, her art is playful and perverse. Her paintings often feature pastel color cartoonish characters engaged in odd, erotic, or grotesque activities. Inspired by her observations growing up in Iran, her peculiar depictions toy with gender roles, as well as sexual and psychological frustrations, topics that are extremely complex and taboo in her homeland. Oh, my love. She moved to the U.S. at age 10 in her MFA at Yale. Uh, her debut New York Soul exhibition uh, featured cake paintings, okay. a series in which men engage in ridiculous and amusing acrobatic activities in around lavish birthday cakes. 
Oh, that sounds like fun. Do you have yeah. an example of that one? Yeah, I do, I think, yeah. Let me just go through these. And she was at the biennial, Whitney Biennial. All right, uh, Nusha Tabakoli in Tehran, lives and works in Tehran. Um, <clears throat> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's a powerful image, isn't it? Is, is that a photograph? Yeah, she's a photographer. She's, mm -hmm. a self she's one of the most unique artists of her generation. Nusha is a self-taught photographer. She began a career as a photojournalist. At the age of 16, she started contributing to the Iranian press. It's pretty amazing. And later on, went to collaborate with the New York Times. Throughout her career, she's covered a wide range of current events, such as Iran's 99 student uprisings, the Iraq War presidential election. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then her works have been uh, wi presented widely at international institutions, Victoria and Albert Museum, the LA County Museum of Art, British Museum, etc. She's earned many accolades for her work and became a Magnum Associate Photographer in 2017. And this guy's a painter next, Imran Afsarian, uh, lives and works in Tehran, born in 74. <clears throat> He's a more traditional painter. Uh, he does uh, interiors, as you can see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What? Is that a typical bed? Um, Someone, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, Beautiful. that's the bed on the left. Uh, Is that not, a typical not day bed? I slept on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. It's I love the yellow. Like, like I say, it does these uh, like scene, interior scenes that, that maybe yeah. does it even have a This has uh, some uh, reminiscences for me of Andrew Wyatt. Those curtains. It's an Andrew Wyatt scene. <laughs> and, and even that, <laughs> he must have been influenced by Andrew Wyatt. I don't like that. I wonder <laughs> if that is influenced by um, Turkish. Um, you know, they had a lot of couches that were low to the ground that you would lie down on. Yeah, Ottomans, right? Yeah. Well, Ottoman usually is the little thing that you put your feet on, I okay. thought. Um, I have no, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just, I thought. It just, looks, it just looks like a real simple petty. <laughs> it looks, like, cover, it looks right. like furniture in a prison is what it looks like. <laughs> oh uh, my goodness. See when I try clicking on it. Uh, see that didn't work. Okay, got me out of there. I should have clicked on it. Let's go back. The bedspread is nice. <laughs> yeah, I just threw a bedspread over something. But um, there's a web page with more of his paintings, so we'll get time to look at that. Um, well, this, uh, it does uh, details of interiors and exteriors of long abandoned homes in Tehran, where the artists have spent time. Yeah, mm -hmm. like one of his paintings was of a of a uh, uh, the ceiling peeling and coming down. You know, just kind of like decay. Uh, all right, so uh, Merdad Afsari lives and works in Tehran. He's another photographer, documentarian, video artist, uh, as well as an honorary member of the Iranian Visual Art Society. Uh, they exclude human subjects. He said he, he, he depicts the mystical, pristine elements of nature and landscapes while pointing at life's fragility and limitations. Traveling across Iran in search of vistas, he captures poetic aspects of his chosen landscapes. That go completely unnoticed by others. Can you show his painting up there again? That's a photograph. Right? Oh. Yeah. So Where is that? Uh, this says desolation memories. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Looks like an old fort with a okay, wall. So, so those. So then, uh, then I went and. Um, so there were, and I went to to look at other the works of these people. So um, the photographer what, is amazing. Yeah, with our remaining time, it's just um, see what we can do. I have to leave, but thank you very much. I'm okay, glad I got yeah. to share with you. Yeah, you're great. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> very thorough. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Bye bye. Notable works. This is the. Uh, uh, and then, this is um, Nusha Tabakolia, born in 81, uh, photographer. Yeah, we, looked at, we like that one. Um, yeah. 
Yes, let's see. What is the third one? Uh, let me just click on this. I think they're all, oh no, it doesn't. Okay, it's like, if I try to enlarge it, it's going to pull it. Well, let me try it and see what happens. Um, I'm afraid I, oh, okay, that's cool. View of Lake Ermia, yeah. Iran. You know where that is, Fresh Day? Lake Ermia, you ever hear that? Yeah, that's in um, east, uh, western Azerbaijan. Okay. It's a uh, right. good sized lake. It's very salty. Are those salt mounds? Kind of a mineral. Yeah. Were those salt mounds, the white things that mm -hmm. look like rocks? Yeah, I think. I think so. You know, it looked to me like it's the edge of a lake or a river or, or ocean part that's frozen. Oh, yeah. That's, that's. Yeah. Well, I, heard, oh. I don't know how much she doctored it, but the red, red water, what that's about, where that's coming from. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I like that. I like that photo. Right? There's Lake Urmia. That's what it is. Yeah. It's very clear. And that yeah. looks to me like frozen. Or oh, the rocks. Icy cold. At the uh, moment, Lake uh, Umia. I like this image. Yeah. yeah, like she's tangled up there and trying to break free of whatever is grabbing her. <clears throat> Some of other work. Oh, Mother Russia. Hmm. Portrait of a lady in Moscow. Wow, <clears throat> that's a powerful image. Blue on blue. Hmm. Uh, Freedom Square, Ron, you know what that is? You know where that is? First thing, Freedom Square. Yeah, it's right in the middle uh, of uh, Tehran as you come in. So it's this, uh, mm -hmm. it's the kind of a Tehran monument. It's called right. Freedom. Is that, is that ironic, the title? <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. the, the balloons. Yeah. Okay. So that's Nusla Tava Kolian. Beautiful architecture uh, piece. Yeah. Avish, let's see. Nazgul, Syrian. I think we looked at that. Hey, one. I found something about uh, Lake Ermia. Okay. It's an Indo Indorheic salt lake in iran the lake is located between the province of east azerbaijan and west azerbaijan in iran and west of the southern portion of the caspian sea let's see what else it says its greatest extent and it was the largest lake in the middle east and the sixth largest salt water lake on the earth with a surface area of approximately 5200 kilometers 2000 square miles a length of 87 miles a width of 34 miles and a maximum depth of 52 feet. By late 2017, the lake had shrunk to 10% of its former size and 1 60th of water volume in 1998 due to persistent general drought in Iran, but also the damming of the local rivers that flow into it and the pumping of groundwater from the surrounding area. This dry spell was broken in 2019 and the lake is now filling up once again. The recovery of the lake has continued in 2020 due to average, above average participation and the actions of the Lake Ermia Restoration Program. Wow, great. Thanks for, for that. I'm glad to hear lots of you. You got it as salt, which was right. Yeah. Wow, right. very good. Yeah, that, <laughs> and that, that kind of lake is a lake that um, is self-contained. Is I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I'll look that word up too, just to be sure. All right, this is Avish uh, Kaber Zadeh uh, and uh, uh, she's one who's lived in Italy and got the best Italian artists, even though she's Iranian. Um, so uh, here's a little video of her work. I don't know if I'll watch the whole thing in seven minutes, but we'll uh, it
I'll stop it there. Um, pretty hypnotic, what do you say? What What is that again? It's called, Very hypnotic. It's, it's called Where Do We Go From Here? It's uh, her installation video. Yeah. Uh, well, that uh, was fascinating, but I didn't un quite understand it. Was it like two planes and then circling the earth and then it looks like a flying saucer going across the earth? Two planes circling a bowl with with other um, color patterns, sky patterns, etc., or urban pattern. So it's a meditative piece, whatever comes up for you, I think. Something about going around and around in a circle. Uh, for me, it just had a, a very calming effect and um, mm -hmm. breathing and, and I don't know, images are coming up. So I, I don't know, it's like the meaning is yours, whatever, but the title is interesting. Where do we go from here? Uh, well, it looked like it showed the earth from space. Yeah, you could, know, have been could have been that. But this, was a, this, is, this is a bowl, it's not, the earth yeah yeah i know that but i was yeah. just saying it yeah. went across what i looked what i thought was the earth and i thought uh -huh. i wonder if that was supposed to be a flying saucer in that instance uh could be <laughs> <laughs> it's okay yeah. i had a, had a flight of imagination no, that's good that's what's supposed to it's supposed to be evocative <laughs> i think i think that, um, mostly uh, it looked like two um eagles or two falcons flying in tandem which I thought was really beautiful. Okay, yeah. I guess falcons, not eagles. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's say this one, number five. Let's say that, a couple minutes. I'll well, probably want to get through all these. Uh, this is this guy that does the sculptures. This is, uh, this is Mohammed Hussein Imad, battling amnesia. Hmm. What is that thing? Good question. Looks like a, a bowl, a bone, or a. He works with wood, prey and dissection wood. Uh, go back to that image. <clears throat> Almost looks like a spinal column, right? <clears throat> to me. It looks like a bone, a um, hip, hip bone, uh, and then a leg bone. Yeah. Of some animal. Uh, the, uh, the whole, the whole uh, exhibit is called "Battling Amnesia," but this one is just untitled. This particular piece. Because mm -hmm. he didn't know what it was. Pray <laughs> 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 in this this section. Today, Rosalie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that untitled wooden memo. So oh, it looks like a temple, a cave. <clears throat> looks like a bird cage. Bird cage could be. Maybe, or maybe it's something that makes music. If those were metal posts that were free mm -hmm. and you could ring it by taking another wooden stick to go across it. Like it's like, yeah, it's, oh. it's interesting joining metal and wood together and, and putting the wood in the middle. This looks like stone, piece of stone on top. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would never have thought that as a piece of art myself. But. Energy resulting from a shared void. <laughs> I think it's funny. <laughs> I don't get what is I mean. <laughs> well, well, okay, so I think like like in how you approach abstract art, um, that it's better not to ask what is it because then you're trying to say, well, what in the real world world does it in the physical um, world that I know does it refer to? Um, just kind of let go of that question and just uh, look at it and see what images come up, what it might remind you of. Uh, any feelings that come up. That's the best way to approach an abstract uh, painting. Or, or, oh, I'm and, not that clear sure. about sure. Say what? A shared void. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's his energy resulting from a shared void. But it, it is interesting looking out, does it? Yeah. Um, is it a coconut? Does it look like a coconut? Uh, I don't think so. It looks like some 
it doesn't look like it looks like a uh, regular wood from a tree that is carved out. I don't know what kind of wood it is. Uh, <clears throat> it is wood, and it looks yeah, like yeah. a bobby pin. If that's what you want to know, what it is. But what feeling does it generate within you? That's that's really <clears throat> what to focus on. Yeah. Or any, oh, yeah. Or any, to uh, me, it focuses images on this. It 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 generates this feeling of having been pierced. Hmm. and um you know this hollowness but still there's that piercing in there and um it's powerful also i got an image of a face suddenly <clears throat> but the metal was the nose <clears throat> and um <clears throat> so that there could be two eyes here yeah suddenly i got a face as you were, as you were talking mm -hmm. Now, kind of going Goldsworthy, huh? Right, yeah. And that's her, Andy Goldsworthy. That's the person I'll say from. Yeah. Ooh, I like those wooden carton two pieces pair. Yeah. <clears throat> I work a little more of his. So, yeah, he's, uh, oh, look at that. A wood metal spring. <laughs> Thousand wood, right. <laughs> right. They're not like anything, um, it's just bringing together disparate elements, wood and metal, and they're not like anything functional or, or anything specific in, in the exterior world. It just uh, has its own presence. Um, yeah. And that's, that's uh, typical for modern sculpture, abstract modern sculpture. Usually there's a, a flow pattern. Uh, all right, let's do one more before we have to end. One more person. So that's him. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think this is a photographer. So we covered a broad range of Persian art, wouldn't you say, Greshe? I'll say. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now those are called battling amnesia. Yeah, that's that whole show, the whole exhibit. There yeah. were so. Oh, I see. Just not that one. Um, no. Okay, so. Uh, but the few before, the few before. Um, they were all under the of the. That's the name of the exhibit, but each one had a different name. Right. Uh, Tala Madari, levitation, spray paint. Uh, wow. Tala Madari. Smiley has no nose. <laughs> Where is he? Here. <laughs> Uh, this is love, love, love doctor. It looks like Smiley's cutting off, doing this. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, Let's see. Um, that's really not so funny no. with the medical world nowadays. Wow. It's been, anyway, so man, it's long. <laughs> Especially in oh, South Carolina. Oh, God. Okay, so the whole, the whole, thinking behind her using the smiley face and distorting it into doing uh -huh. cool things apparently and making some kind of social mm -hmm. commentary as a result. So yeah. Um, all right, we got time for one more. So that was Tala Madani and something for- Where is this in the United States? Um, I think so, yeah. And here's this person. Last one, number seven. Uh, Parasto Farahua. Oh, yeah. Mm. Uh, 
grass is green, the sky is blue, and she's black. So, yeah. okay. So, can I get to this? Can you open up? Yeah, so there's a whole series of these kind of black and white organic patterns. Yeah. <clears throat> Playing with eyes. Eyes and hands. What hands are doing? Pointing hands. Kind of the hand shapes. Kind of like almost like MC Escher. In a way, but different. Yeah. Are uh, these just with ink? Ink drawing? Yeah, I think so. And this, this one. So uh, working with complex patterns, drapery. <laughs> She's influenced by the history of Persian oriental miniature and ornamental painting. And in this context, her history, her memory can only appear as fragments. Ornament dominates the surface and its narrative can only create uh, space in fragmentary and symbolic illusions, etc. We're down to three minutes. So, yeah, it looks like drape. It looks like um, um, drapes or fabric. But what's that? I guess they're paintings. Uh, it's a sublimation, um, sublimation print on fabric. Wow. <clears throat> With this one, the grass is green, the sky is blue, and she is black. <clears throat> ah. I see. Oh, that's powerful, me. <clears throat> All right, looks like we should uh, end it. Um, uh, okay, so interesting. We cover a lot of. <clears throat> Iranian art through the centuries. Uh, this particular, if you want to explore these people more, again, it's uh, if you just do um, uh, 10, um, let me just go to this slide again. <clears throat> 10 Iranian artists who are shaping contemporary art. You, you would just have to Google that and it would pop up this page. <laughs> I'll explore them some more. Uh, all right, stop the share. Stop the recording.